North Carolina for a long time. Uh, I came here for graduate school in 76. Never left. <laughs> uh, and my uh, graduate work actually was in entomology, so I am in fact an entomologist. Um, and this talk is geared towards not using pesticides because more and more of us are concerned about preserving beneficial insects, predators, and pollinators. So um, that's most the focus is going to be on how to how to deal with insects uh, without using pesticides. So um, it's important to learn. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to read some of this because I've got so much info here. Uh, to be able to determine what is an insect problem and uh, whether it warrants treatment. <clears throat> and, you know, we have learned how to distinguish uh, three leaf uh, Virginia creeper from poison ivy. So that kind of looking at things and seeing, okay, there's the difference, is important also in figuring out what your insect problems are. Uh, one of the things I would suggest you do if you have an insect you don't know what it is, is when you use the web, use this site colon edu in your search line along with the description of what you have. I mean, say you have beetle, big white spots, <coughs> site colon edu, and then click on images. This takes you to on the university site, so that somebody on one of these places where they post their pictures has not mislabeled the insect. And then you can follow the links, once you find something that looks like what you have, follow the links to the university site and start getting information. So that's a, a very handy way to um, uh, figure out for yourself, you know, just use your descriptors. So, <clears throat> I'm going to cover only a few of the major pests that we've seen, but feel free to ask questions about what I don't cover uh, when we do discussion at the end of this. Um, first, uh, chewing insects. Uh, adult beetles tend to make holes in leaves, although uh, the larvae often feed from the outside of the leaves. Now, in fact, we have very few beetle larvae that are on plants above ground. They're feeding on roots mostly underground as, as larvae, and that's wireworms and other grubs. <coughs> um, caterpillars often work from the outside of leaves. Although they can also, when they're very young, do this sort of skeletonizing that we see here. <coughs> um, and these are, these inchworms are oak canker worms. And they have become a problem here now in the spring, and there are a variety of reasons for that. One is that we plant a lot of oaks in our suburban uh, habitat, and we don't plant a lot of other trees. So we have that, that's the first part of the problem. The second part of the problem is that the larvae <coughs> uh, come out just at the time that migrating birds arrive, except that with warmer weather now, many years, the larvae are out before the migrators arrive. And so we do not have, and there's a reduction in the tropical migrants. So, you know, this is a triple whammy. So we do have more of a problem with these than we used to. And one of the solutions that has been proposed by folks at NC State is to use tack trap. And I haven't brought this beautiful paintbrush, and this is the way I keep my tack, tra tack trap. You can buy it in a jug <coughs> uh, from hardware stores or online if you can't find it locally. Put it on a uh, piece of tape or <clears throat> uh, cloth wrapped around an oak that has been infested. And you think, well, why would this work? Well, it turns out that after the larvae feed, they, they go to the ground on little silken threads. They pupate in the ground right at the base of your tree. <clears throat> and then they emerge <clears throat> in the fall. Well, females are wingless. So they can't 
fly anywhere, they're going to walk back up the same tree. And so if you put this tape around before November, sometime in October, and you don't have to leave it all year, just you know, during this period when they're when they're walking up the tree, you will help to break the cycle. And now no, they didn't used to be a problem, but if you get the if you get them coming up the same tree year after year, what happens is the branches get defoliated over and over again and they will die. So you do want to sort of think about, is this an important tree? Do I want to keep this tree and is the problem severe enough to do something? And, and Tanglefoot, although it's really messy stuff, wear gloves, um, is, is an effective way to sort of interrupt that cycle. Please, what yeah. is the name of the product? Oh, this is, this is called Tangle Foot, uh, but there, it's also called Tack Trap, I mean, <coughs> A-C-T. Yeah, well, or Tangle Foot, I think, is what I could find online. Is there a tape that's um, less messy, but <coughs> does this? I, I use um, duct tape, um, but the catch is that with, with any kind of a tape, there's a lot of sort of ins and outs in the in the bark, so that <clears throat> the 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 adults going climbing up the tree can go under the tape. So so look carefully. A, a burlap strips also can work, and they're a little more uh, attaching to the tree, although they're harder to put around, especially if you have a big tree. Because how do you hold it here while you walk around it? So. <clears throat> Um, is this specific to oaks or does it move to oaks? Oaks. oaks. It is the oak tangle yeah. uh, So, so this this is why it's not a problem often in forests because there are so many other trees around. You know, these individuals when they come out, they just go up the nearest tree. Well, the nearest tree is a hickory. Forget it. So, um, you know, they are they, these uh, females are laying their eggs in the bark crevices up near the top of the tree. So what you want to do, you want to interrupt their movement up the tree. <coughs> um, and let's see, on the right, the skeletonizing, whoops, hit the wrong button, is done by uh, the orange-striped oakworm. And these are the insects that we see cascading to the ground along with their frass, which is another word for insect poop. Um, uh, in, August or so. And although we think of them as a problem, and we get a lot of calls, what is all this stuff all over my sidewalk? They look like little hill, little sort of cylindrical things. Um, they, in fact, very rarely cause a problem and are not, when it, uh, there is no control recommended for them. <clears throat> but if you want to target immature caterpillars, on your plants. There are some non-pesticidal solutions. One is kale and clay, which you can put into a, a duster and use because it has a little abrasion uh, and, and soft-bodied insects require their cuticle to be intact in order to not dehydrate. So moving around on this slight abrasive can actually kill them. Um, also, uh, Bt, Bacillus thuringiensis, can be effective on certain insects. Now, Bt is monospecific. That means that each strain works on a specific species of insects. There are a lot of strains. Some of them even work on Aedes aegypti, which is the um, tiger mosquito, which we're all concerned about because it is a um, vector of some very important human diseases. But uh, uh, you know, so you can look for um, Dipel or other such uh, BT products, but note that your pest may not be targeted by the strains of BT in what you just bought. So if in that, if, when you're using something like that, it's important to sort of have a good idea of what is your pest. Um, so some of our caterpillars, um, especially agricultural pests, can go through as many as like five generations a year in North Carolina. And
and you know, with exponential growth and plenty of food source, that's a huge population. But most of the insects, especially horticultural ones, go through one or two generations a year. So this means that you need to make a call and say, is this damage really worth doing something about, or can I live with it? And that's one of the things that, I mean, this topic is living with insects, and some of it is living with insect damage. <coughs> um, nocturnal slugs, of course, can get really big, and the amount of damage they can do is commensurate with their size. And sometimes it's easy to sort of think, oh, this must have been caterpillars that did this, because there's not a whole lot of difference in the kinds of chopping off of leaves that you would see. But there are a couple of things to think about when it's slugs. And one is, did it happen overnight? Because that's when slugs are out. <clears throat> and do you see these slime trails? Now, if you go out later in the day, you won't see them. They're dried up. Dried up. You might see bits underneath leaves. But, but if you're out early in the morning, you can see the slime trails. And that's a dead giveaway. So what works? The year. I think it works better than boards that you can put down, although recently I discovered in a bunch of pots that we had piled up outside that, that stored pots are a great place for slugs to overwinter. So if you have slugs in your garden and you have piles of pots, go through them. And you know, you can kill them however you want. They're kind of disgusting when you pick them up. So you might want to use gloves or use something else to destroy them. Um, Did you say to use beer? Where would you use it? Beer. Put it in a pine plate or uh, something like that. Put it out in your garden and do it in the evening. And uh, in the mornings, you can go out and check your, your, um, your beverage for tasting treats. <laughs> So you have the slug bait that you can buy. At they, the that also works, um, and, and uh, that is a poison, and it is specific to slugs. So uh, a lot of people do use slug baits, and in fact, my husband, who has four kids, uses slug bait because it's hard to stop. You do want to be careful because the birds will then eat the slug that's poisoned and die. That's true. That is true. So I, I really, I think it's not. Yeah. So if you do the beer, they just get drunk. Well, they, they actually sort of go <laughs> 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 Yeah. Thanks for having us. Uh-huh. The slug that's in the zest goes home, dies in the ground. Did you hear that? Sluggo has uh, iron phosphate in it and is, um, causes indigestion and the slug dies in that. No, they don't. Yeah, they don't see any. Yeah. Well, they, they they always go back to shady, moist areas during the day because they don't have any way to protect themselves from the noonday sun. But the other <coughs> um, slug bait makers, they including true bugs, uh, have very different mouth parts. They have this sort of, their, their mandibles have been made into like a straw, and they actually pierce the plant material and they suck out plant juices. So it's different kind of damage as well. <clears throat> and this is armored scale. And believe it or not, these are on the surface, not inside this poet's laurel leaf. <clears throat> Um, and this is an armored scale, so you can imagine that using a, um, uh, a pesticide on them is difficult because they are protected. <coughs> um, and it's one of those things that you can use horticultural oils on, but you really have to catch them when they're tiny and they're moving around um, in, in order to get good control. So you'll have to sort of reuse it as you as uh, uh, as time goes by. And this is woolly aphid damage actually on elm. And uh, I bring this 
this up because <clears throat> uh, this kind of curling makes it very difficult to use things like insecticidal soaps and horticultural oils. And this is the one pesticide I'm going to recommend is imidacloprid. May be necessary. Um, it is a uh, local systemic and it can help to control them. But you can also, if you see a couple of individual leaves, pluck them. Just take them off your plant and, and that will help with your control. <clears throat> uh, if you do use uh, horticultural soaps, note that some plants are more sensitive than others. Uh, and so it's a good idea after the soap is dry to sort of give, give your plants a rinse. <clears throat> Keep an eye on your plants because you may not have got all of the insects in the little crevices. So you will probably have to be reapplying. Um, you can, by the way, use dish detergent, uh, about a tablespoon in a quart. Uh, of water is pretty effective uh, and cheaper. Uh, some of the horticultural soaps are thought to be a little less toxic to plants. I, in fact, do the detergent root, root and I have not ever had any problems myself. <clears throat> um, so, uh, how does soap work? Well, first of all, you know, we talked about the cuticle of the insect and kale and sort of wrecking the surface. Well, Soap breaks down the cuticle layer on the outside of an insect, and then they, then they dehydrate that way. Additionally, you get the added benefit is because, because it gives <coughs> the surface tension on the water. And insects breathe through spiracles on their sides. You basically they suffocate the insects because the water, instead of sort of beating around the spiracles, actually will go in. <coughs> So, so you're drowning them as well. Um, at blooming scale, I wanted to mention that it is a problem, uh, especially on red oaks, and uh, they just did some studies in Raleigh, and it was interesting that where trees are warmer, there's more gloomy scale, and they found that on trees, on red oaks, in the hottest parts of Raleigh, there were 200 times more gloomy scale than there were on oaks, uh, on maples in cooler spots. So, you know, here we are planting them along streets. We're providing a monoculture feast. You know, we, we don't have a lot of diversity, so we need to think about broadening the palette of our plantings if we really want to sort of skirt some of these insect issues. <clears throat> now, gloomy scale, can be uh, well controlled with horticultural oils. Um, if you're going to use one in the summer particularly, you want to use a very lightweight oil because leaves breathe too. They have stomates and you can suffocate your leaves just as you can suffocate your scale. So um, some of the heavier ones are better to use uh, when the trees are not in leaf. <coughs> and it is more effective on the scale. So sometimes you just have to wait. The scale will be there during the winter. It doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> so, um, uh, and uh, one of the things about using uh, horticultural soaps is that because you really have to be soaking the insects that you're getting, you're really not having an impact on predators and pollinators who are not the insects you're targeting, because there is no residual effect. Um, let's see. Oh, woolly aphids. Oh, here's another one where do we really want this plant? Woolly aphids are a problem, but only on silver maple. So you might say, well, I'm going to have to use the metacloprid. The other possibility is don't plant silver maples. If you have one, you're going to, you know, have to live with the problem, and you may have to use an insecticide, but. Uh, the other thing is to think, think about what you're planting. <clears throat> uh, leaf hoppers, and these guys over here are actually, these little fuzzy guys, are leaf hoppers, <clears throat> uh, and plant hoppers, and tree hoppers, all again are in that same bug family and have sucking mouth parts, and can be controlled again using horticultural soaps. 
although if they have wax on them, it's more difficult, just as a woolly aphids, it's more difficult to control them <coughs> with, a, with a soap because it's harder to get through all that fuzz. <coughs> Okay, um, spider mites cause damage. It looks kind of like hazing. And actually, believe it or not, I think that guy right there is a spider mite. But um, they, how they work on the plant is they, they, you know, they're really tiny and they go into individual cells and they suck the juice out of the mesophyll layer of the leaf. And so you see this sort of stippling effect. <coughs> Um, and uh, horticultural soaps will work on mites. <coughs> um, let's see, we're down so, Oh, and how do you know you even have them? I mean, they are really small. First of all, you can sometimes see them with the naked eye, particularly if you take a piece of paper and you put it under a leaf that you think is affected, and you bing the leaf and, and you see it, and then you'll see these little dots. Well, are they mites? poke them with your fingernail or a pencil, and if they move, they're alive. Um, uh, I do recommend that you invest in a hand lens. 10 power is all you need, but I gotta tell you, of course, I'm a, I'm a bugologist, but I got a few of them. <laughs> I have one in everything I carry around. So, um, and I have my own that sits at home as well. So uh, invest in a, um, hand lens, it's well worth it, uh, it for helping to see insects. Also, it works on plant diseases sometimes because you can say, oh yeah, I do see that little bit of fuzziness there. So it means that this, this is a fungus and it is sporulating. So, um, so spider mites are uh, called spider mites because they form webbing. So that's, that's how they got their name. And when they get high enough populations, they go up to the top of the plant and they balloon in the wind to the next plant. <clears throat> so you do want to sort of keep an eye on populations. However, I should mention that if you can tolerate them for long enough, usually there are plenty of predators that will come along and take care of the problem for you. There are predaceous mites, there's my new pirate bug, um, <clears throat> lace wings, there are, um, is there anybody else I'm forgetting? Uh, oh, even some ants. <clears throat> um, and uh, so another thing also that works uh, on mice is sulfur, but when if you're going to apply it, you really do need to be wearing a mask. You need to be careful you're not breathing this stuff in. Okay, so uh, beetles, moths and butterflies, <coughs> uh, bees, wasps, all do a major transformation between their larval stage and their adult stage. Mouth parts change, all kinds of things change. <coughs> but uh, a lot of insects, and so the caterpillars that are munching on your plants become the pollinators later. <coughs> but uh, bugs, and grasshoppers and a number of other insects actually gradually morph into adult stages and do not change their mouse parts. So this actually is the spittle mass. Here is the spittle bug inside, and here is the adult two-line spittle bug. So this guy is actually responsible for this. And Spittle bugs are not usually a problem. They can be a problem sometimes on turf, sometimes on a few ornamentals. Uh, they're, it's, it's difficult to sort of get soap in there, but if you can stand it, just interrupt that slimy little bubbly saliva mass. And, um, and these guys will then dry out. They cannot survive without having that sort of protective coating. So that's uh, a way to sort of interrupt them. What, what was the solution? Pick them up. I mean, just get rid of the slime. Just, just put your finger in the slime and go and, and then what's left will not have enough cohesion. gook around it to keep them moist, Maybe basically. Hose them off? Would they be would Well, they hose them? you might be able to hose them off. You probably could. Uh, and, and you say hosing, in fact, 
sometimes in a sprayer with uh, just water in it because you can really direct it and right in that spot, you know, uh, get them. But, but the thing is to get them out of that spittle mass for control. But in fact, rarely they are a problem. And if you've got a problem with them in your turf, you know, you're not going to go around doing that. <laughs> so, I would, but I don't have any grass, so. <laughs> um, so, it's, you know, many of us know a lot of the insects. I mean, we recognize bagworms, leaf miners, and many, many others. But you can also do some differentiation of eggs. And these ovoid eggs are the kinds of eggs that beetles lay. And these are, in fact, ladybugs. Uh, stink bugs tend to have round eggs, and they pack them in in a sort of a honeycomb fashion. And the caterpillars take, the moths and butterflies take the uh, prize for prettiest eggs. Uh, they're, they're sort of cylindrical, and oftentimes they're interesting uh, and, uh, and pretty. So that's something to look for. As you're in the garden, oh, I found eggs. What kind of egg? If they look like this, Leave them. And as you can see, some adult has laid eggs right in the midst of a bunch of aphids. So, you know, she was there for a reason. Yeah. So if they're round, you could feel pretty comfortable about that trying are, to get that rid of them? bug eggs. Now, there are a few bugs that are predation, but most of them are but yeah, if you see them on the, un and often they're on the underside of a leaf. And see this, here's the vein on the underside of the leaf. Here's the vein on the underside of the leaf. This is the underside of the leaf. This is where you look. <clears throat> they are going to put the, the egg, lay their eggs in a protected spot. That said, I've had them lay them on the glass of my, of my sliding door. <laughs> I was like, what are you thinking? <laughs> <clears throat> um, so, uh, you, uh, although some insects, such as bloomy scales I mentioned, are around in the winter, most of the insects that we find above ground arrive in the spring. And so <clears throat> what you want to do is you want to get out as soon as you get warm weather and start scouting. This is your most important control measure, is keeping an eye on what you you know, when you're out there and you're pulling up those weeds, look at your plants. <clears throat> look to see if you begin to see leaf curl by aphids, where because they're feeding underneath the leaf and they're causing the leaf to not expand properly. So, you know, just sharpen your vision and, and you can do a lot of control just by getting rid of the problem before it gets big. <clears throat> um, let's see, where am I going here? Oh, the aphids. <clears throat> This is a winged adult. Now, winged adults come in either blown on wind currents from the south, or they have overwintered as eggs on woody hosts. And they arrive on your plants, and this is, this is one of my irises, in the spring. And they reproduce parthenogenically, which means that she basically, and they're live bearers. So she is basically a baby machine, and she's producing clones of herself. And each one of these clones is going to produce more. And their life cycle in warm weather can be less than a week. So this means that if you don't watch it in two weeks, you can have a really big aphid problem. But again, you know, insecticidal soaps will work. So, but if you can find them, if you can find these winged girls, then these are the ones that mean that your populations are just starting. So watch for them. And it is, you know, March that you'll see the wing adults. <clears throat> um, also, plants from nurseries <coughs> can be a very nice way to introduce mice, <clears throat> aphids, eggs of uh, various insects. So when you buy plants, Look at them. Look at them in the nursery. Make sure they are clean. You know, just like anybody who has a greenhouse is not going to bring all kinds of stuff in until they're made sure that they don't have any uh, disease or insect problems. 
you need to do the same thing if you're going to put things into your home environment. I'm sure. I know I have introduced lovely weeds on um, plants that I brought in. I didn't even know I had them until <laughs> the seeds germinated, and there they were. <clears throat> um, so, uh, most bugs are plant feeders, but there are a few that are predaceous. And this is the wheel <clears throat> assassin bug. That's the knock of a wheel. They call it something or other. Um, yeah, a wheel bug. Yeah, it is a wheel bug. So, um, and it has these great mouth parts. Now, this is the larval form, not the larva, the nymphal form. So you see, it's the mouth parts are still the same. <clears throat> and one of the ways you can characterize these assassin bugs is that when they are at rest, you see that you can see some of their abdomen on the outside of their uh, of their wings. <clears throat> this is the minute pirate bug. So it's a good predator on mites. <clears throat> Also, uh, it can be uh, good on aphids and some other things. And this, believe it or not, is a stink bug, which is a predator. It's the spine soldier bug. It's probably the only stink bug that we really want to have around. <coughs> but uh, it does, it is an effective predator. <coughs> um, so please. some stink bugs are good and some aren't? That one. That one. That one. How do we know it's How do you that way? way? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's, see, it is aptly named the spine stink bug. Um, and there are not many that have such pointed um, thoraxes. So that's sort of what to look for. And it has this sort of characteristic shield shape. So there's really nice straight back here. But if in doubt, um, you know, there are so many more stink bugs that are problems than not problems that you might well want to just get rid of them. <clears throat> um, uh, also note that um, these guys can also give a very mean bite. Um, they, with their piercing mouth parts, they can stab you. And in <coughs> kissing bug, which, and the other Gina that's down here, this uh, 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 trans transmits um, a couple of very nasty diseases. Can you tell me what? Mm -mm. Yeah. Just the kissing bug, but we, I don't know that we've really seen this, have we? No, but they're concerned that they're coming. Mm -hmm. Anyway, they can, they can give uh, all of these, um, <coughs> not the plant-eating bugs, but the predaceous bugs can give you a mean bite. So handle with care. Uh, beetles, we all know this is a ladybug beetle, uh, a ladybug uh, larva, which looks entirely different from its adult. And so uh, most of our beetles are in fact plant eaters, but there are a whole host of them that are uh, good guys, the brown beetles, uh, soldier beetles, fireflies even, which are beetles, and lady beetles. And these are rove beetles, <clears throat> and they are also predaceous. This is the larval form, and this is the adult. You can recognize the rove beetle. See that really short elytra here? And some of the uh, rove beetles actually are uh, parasitoids. Uh, whereas generalists will, uh, whereas predators are generalists and will eat sort of whatever is put in front of them, Cicada killer wasp. parasitoids are very specific and they will usually only attack a species of parasitoid will attack a species of uh, other insects. So here, these, although often called eggs, are in fact the pupae of a tiny wasp, all of whom have eaten the insides of this hornworm as larvae, <laughs> and then come out, attach themselves to the cuticle to pupate. So this, this hornworm, which is not, oh, I did that. You did that. 
<laughs> is, is not going to make it to pupation itself, has managed to sponsor about 50 parasitoids that are then going to move on to other hornworms. Uh, these, this right here, so here's a, re here's a regular aphid, here's a regular aphid. This guy, this guy, this guy, this guy are all, we call them aphid mummies. In fact, it's the shell of the aphid with a teeny tiny affolinid uh, wasp inside. And there is one here, right there, see it? <clears throat> so if you see your aphids, have, you see a lot of these sort of pearly ones, and they're kind of plump looking. They are dead, and they are, uh, the, these uh, wasps are pupating inside them. So these, you don't want to remove them because, you know, they're going to be out there doing in more aphids. Now, I included this, Gus, such a great picture. <laughs> uh, this is a cicada killer, and what she has done is she has paralyzed this cicada. She's going to carry it back to her burrow. Going to put in the little cell, lay a little egg on it, cover it all up. The egg is going to then eat the cicada through the winter <coughs> uh, as a as a larva, of course. And pupate in the spring, come out in about July or August, just in time to get the next generation of adult annual cicadas. Now the cicada killer is a bruiser. People get really spooky and think, "Oh my God, it'll sting me." No. It's not interested in you. It's not going to sting you. <clears throat> uh, and it only uh, feeds on the annual cicada, and it doesn't affect the periodic, the 13 and 17 year ones. So it's pretty neat the way many parasitoids uh, have managed to sort of sync their life cycle with the life cycle of their host. OK, I know a lot of us have visceral aversion <coughs> to spiders. But if you can avoid the temptation, let it be. They are really doing a, a good thing. Um, I actually take them out of my house. Most folks will not actually carry them out of their houses. <laughs> um, and, and what's amazing here, this is this was this spider lives in my at my house, did live at my house, <laughs> is it actually nails? I mean, this is impressive. Look at the size of this guy. Yeah. It's got it. It's a lot of to eat. I've yeah. got to tell you, I've got one over that. We had one of those big yellow, black, and white garden spiders mm -hmm. in Texas about that big. And it went into our screened-in back porch one day and s spun a gigantic web. I came home and heard a strange screeching, crying sound went out there. Oh, it had right. caught a hummingbird oh, in oh, it yeah. and wrapped <laughs> it totally oh, and oh, had oh. paralyzed it but not oh. killed it. There are actually some some spiders in Texas that, and you see them over the roads too, and we don't have them, and they do get bats and um, uh, hummingbirds. Uh, I don't think anything around us will, but yeah, they, they are really, they can be very impressive. Um, so how do we, where do we draw the line on what's a pest and what's not a pest? Because, I mean, I have, a lot of native plants in my gardens, and I know a lot of you have a lot of native plants in your <laughs> gardens. I mean, these are the hosts of the butterflies and the moths, and of course, they're also the hosts of a lot of other things that we will find in our gardens. So, I mean, here this, this Cecropia was eating <clears throat> uh, birch, and what else was it eating? Uh, let me see here. Um, Sorry, folks. Uh, maples and wild cherry. <clears throat> and then they become adults. And, you know, we all like the moths, so live with the damage. By the way, this is an FYI because it can't help it. This is a girl. See how her antennae are kind of plumy, but not very? And this is a male. And he has much more plumose antennae because he has to pick up the pheromones from the females who are out there so that he would be able to find them and mate. <clears throat> Louise, is that true in most moths? Yeah, it is. Yeah. So the boys have these great antennae. <clears throat> so 
Uh, it really goes back to you know what what you can stand now. Leaf miners, and this is actually on green and gold, believe it or not. Um, you know, I know they form those little trails, but you can pluck off an individual leaf, and if you're and in fact, leaf miners are virtually impossible to kill with anything topical because they're inside the leaf. <clears throat> but if you can pluck it early enough, you will not only get rid of your ugly leaf, but you might actually get rid of the containing fly. So you have interrupted the life cycle. Interrupt that life cycle, you know. Get them early, get them often. <clears throat> Okay, now there are a few invasive insects <clears throat> that you might really want to mount a serious campaign against. It. And I know we were talking about Japanese beetles earlier. The fact is that anything in the rose family is a magnet for Japanese beetles. So are you not going to grow blackbirds? Are you not going to grow flowering crab? Are you not going to have a lawn where they all survive during the winter eating the roots of your grass? Probably you're going to say, no, well, I want my lawn and I want whatever other thing. Well, how are you going to deal with them? The problem with using insecticide is that anything that's flowering, if you put the insecticide on it, you're going to be affecting the pollinators. Uh, and insecticides are not discriminating. They kill the predators too. So you can be start with some creative solutions. This, a friend of mine, was showing off his hand bath. <laughs> he goes out a couple times a day with his little hand bath. And I told him he really does need to clean it out after every use because it was getting very light. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it works. Yeah. And, it, and it didn't damage the leaves. It was, you know, not super powerful. And he was out there and, and you know, he collected probably 50 or so in, in the five minutes that I watched him do this, it was pretty fun. <laughs> um, this is, of course, the soap solution, uh, and uh, it can also work with Japanese beetles. The problem with Japanese beetles, of course, is that you tap them, and half of them will drop, but the other half of them will fly, and you just lost them. Uh, but things, now, what I'm nailing here are brown marmorated stink bugs that we will see trying to get into our homes in the fall because they cannot overwinter outside. They need a protected, warmer space. So that's why they're all over our houses trying to get in so they can overwinter. So, uh, and how do I know it's a brown marmorated stink bug? Stripes. And you can't see it very well, but actually they have little stripes and right along the side of their abdomen there's this banding. Uh, they're called mar brown marmorated, marmorated word for marble is because they're, the, uh, the coloration on their back is sort of swirly, but I think the stripes on the sides are a, a better diagnostic. But anyway, the old tap and drop can work for a lot of insects, you know, into soapy solution. I would not recommend you use kerosene or gasoline or anything like that, kind of nasty, but soap works. Um, so, so you really want to sort of be creative <clears throat> about how you're going to interrupt the life cycle. Put your hand up. Can you use IPA of isopropanol? Uh, you works, could. It's great you, for roaches. Yeah. Well, the thing is, again, that they're basically, you know, it's toxic and they're drowning instantly. Um, you could, um, but a, a couple drops of dish detergent is just is probably cheaper. Um, it, it, I suspect they rise more in um, isopropyl alcohol. So if you enjoy, <laughs> <laughs> enjoy that, it might be a good way to go. Um, and so katsu bugs are another one of these newer invasive problem, pests. Um, but again, they go for one family of, of plants, pea family. So if you have wisteria, if you're crazy enough to have wisteria, um, uh, 
keep an eye on it because anything in that family is going to be attractive to kudzu bugs. So uh, the soap will work, uh, uh, horticultural oils will work on them. Uh, so think about what you plant and where you plant it. Do you really not want to have to deal with Japanese beetle? Don't plant anything in the rose family. It's easy for me, I don't have any sun, so it's like, oh, roses? <laughs> um, and um, use fertilizer sparingly because insects uh, really like tender new growth. So the more you fertilize, the more new growth you get, the bigger your insect population is will grow. So, uh, think about that and be vigilant. Look at your plants. Go out there and walk around uh, and especially in the spring, the sooner you interrupt populations, the more likely <clears throat> you will be able to keep your damage levels uh, you know, at a level that you can stand. Um, and have a good time out there. You know, I mean, I always, I actually like weaving. Crazy one. Um, <clears throat> Remember, we are all, uh, including insects, in the garden together. Now, I have some uh, suggested references. <coughs> uh, the first one is <coughs> uh, the Extension Master Gardener Handbook. And <coughs> that is <coughs> now available. I want you to just pass it back. It's now available uh, online. Uh, used to only be for Master Gardeners. We no longer calling it the Extension Master Gardener Handbook. We're just calling it the Extension Gardener Handbook. It is right now in the process of being created, but many of the chapters are done. The one on insects is done. The one on diagnostics is done. The one on IPM, integrated pest management, is done. Um, it's a great resource. <coughs> uh, this book, Good Garden Bugs, done by Mary Gardner, who's an extension agent in Ohio, has huge number of pictures of predatory insects. <clears throat> so, you know, if you want something that you can sort of thumb through, it will show you all of the lady beetles. I did not do much on ladybugs. Most, right now, we have some <clears throat> Asian ladybugs, which are different from our native. They are voracious, and they, in fact, eat the larvae of our natives. And I don't think there's any way we can interrupt that. But if you buy ladybugs to put in your garden, you are buying Asians. So you need to know. I mean, they are good predators, but they're also interfering with some of the fellows who were actually there before. <coughs> um, if you don't want to buy a book and you just want to read, this um, thing, the major groups of na uh, natural enemies and the, and the list that I gave you actually gives you all the separate links. This XXX here is one of these numbers and it covers the, uh, predators and parasitoids and it's really extensive. <clears throat> uh, uh, another thing I have included is um, University of Nevada did a really nice little monograph on spider mite control in the home garden, and it is, gives you lots of solutions that are not pesticidal. So, uh, you know, there's lots of ways around it. So, that's it. Question. Back up a bit. Uh, spider mites need dry, warm conditions, and you can spray uh, portable water and remove them from the plant. They then will be underground. They're not very really good at getting back up on the plant. That's true. Once mm -hmm. they've been washed off. That's true. And the plant then is moist on the inside. Yes. Yeah. Now the catch with with the spider with getting spider mites, even you know, whether you're using a insecticidal soap or just water or whatever, is that they can be down in the crevices, oh, you know, yeah. right at the leaf axles, and you don't get them all. Yeah. <laughs> but, but you're right that, that they, you know, moisture is their enemy. And that's why our biggest problem with them is when it's hot and dry in the summer. 
um, then you cold press last for three months or or thereabout. And any time the blossoms are being attracted to bees, it's going to affect. Now, did you hear that the, about imidacloprid and its and its uh, life? But it is only locally systemic, so it doesn't go throughout the whole plant. I mean, you can if you apply it at the root system, but if you're applying it topically, yeah. uh, it's a root plant, and that's yeah. often used. Yeah. Um, yeah. And this is this is why we don't. I mean, when I was in graduate school, we had a huge number of systemics that were magic. I mean, we could control anything. And then we said, it's in the groundwater. So there are very few systemics now that are uh, licensed for use at all. And the reason is that they do have such persistent toxicity. Um, on the ladybug issue, yeah. I noticed there are certain ladybugs that seem to come in houses over the winter. Asians. Are those the those are the Asians, Asians. Yes. Okay. and again, they're looking for warmer places yes. to overwinter. Okay. <laughs> so the, the stink bugs, the a Asiatic uh, ladybugs, um, who else tries to get into your house in winter? Fox elder bugs. Fox elder bugs, yeah. And kudzu bugs can also try. One more thing, don't use a vacuum cleaner that has a Grinder. <laughs> oh, jeez. <yeah. laughs> and actually, people use people can use a vacuum cleaner also on stink bugs in their house. But if you do, make it a dedicated. <laughs> vacuum I mean, they don't call it stink bugs for nothing. <laughs> um, and, and so keep it in the garage, empty the bag. Yeah, and and if you have one with a propeller that grinds them up, then then you just. Add it to your aroma. Yeah. <laughs> um, Louise, uh, flea beetles have just reached a level of intolerance on my eggplants. Um, so what to do? What to do? What's the problem? Is that what you're seeing is the adults too, and the adults are much harder uh, to treat because uh, they're pretty well protected by their shell. Yeah. yeah. Dietinaceous? Maybe. What do you think? Dietinaceous, sir. Is that it's, it, it, I, I was going to ask you that same question. Yeah, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I mean, you're the, you're the home gardener and extension agent here. Uh, Does anybody I mean, know Gina Myers? You have to hit them with probably oil or insecticidal soap. You might kill them then, but they're tough. Yeah, they're, they they're are tough ones. They are. I think dietinaceous, sir, only works marginally. I've, I've interplanted them with peppers, and the pepper was kind of keeping them away, but now they've grown up beyond the peppers, and all the new growth is just being eaten alive, the poor things. Well, I have to tell you a very sad thing. When I first moved to North Carolina, I thought, oh, wait, I'm going to do home gardening. I never realized that North Carolina was the intersection of the northern limit of southern insects uh -huh. and the southern limit of northern insects. We have more bugs. <laughs> and so, I mean, I, I, you know, I did not want to use pesticides, and it was really, I was really pressed. So I don't actually have a home garden anymore. How about soapy water, my friend? <laughs> well, anything, if you can get it on the insect, it will work. Oh, no I problem. Mean, it's not going to destroy the cuticle because they're, these guys are tough. These are adults. But you may drown them. Remember the spiracles. Mm -hmm. All insects have to breathe through these holes in their sides. And so if you can wet them with soapy water, you have a good chance of, of drowning them. The difficulty is they seem to sense you coming, and they all just yeah. 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 <laughs> they pop off. Yeah, yeah. Head on over to the peppers where they just rest for a while. <laughs> Um, I do want to say people oftentimes want to ID their bugs, which is a great thing, you know, to figure out what what the insect is, not the bug. Louise has taught me a lot about uh, yeah, but I grow bugs too. Okay. Right. Um, so what you can do is you can catch them, put them in a jar, put them in the refrigerator, chill them down till they're real slow, then you can pull them out and take photos of them. If you've got a nice iPhone or something, you can sometimes get pretty good photos. Yeah. And then you can send the photo to us, 
or you can click on the photo and say search Google for similar. But well, sometimes actually, you, I, you know, I, Google isn't good enough. It's to not do that great yet because no. I mean, I try, I had a leaf of something and I thought I don't know what this is and I took a picture and put it up and it said it's a leaf. It only works about half the time. So, yeah, so I mean, work. some Google is getting better, yeah. but you can describe. Also, uh, you can use PDIC, the Plant Disease and Insect Clinic at NC State. It is free. If you you have to set up a little account, but they will ID uh, disease and insect problems for free from photos. If you submit stuff cost of money. But if you do photos, it's it's free. So, you know, that's a that's another option. And the fact is that I I most of the time you really don't need to know exactly what the species is. It's if it's an aphid, you know pretty much what your control measures are going to be. It doesn't matter whether it's a, um, a melon aphid or a cotton aphid or um, uh, or cabbage aphid, whatever, it's an aphid, same control measures. So um, that's why I think that to some extent it, it, it matters, and a lot of times it's just the, the curiosity. We want to know exactly what. Yeah, happens. and if you get a hand lens like she mentioned, you just will be blown away by the insect. Mm. And, also, really and also, although I, I do really recommend the hand lens, there's also this really expensive but very nice toy for an iPhone. And I had one on my old iPhone, and I haven't yet invested for my new iPhone. Uh, it's a lens. old it's an ocular. Or, or? Uh, all, Ollie, Ollie. Yeah, yeah, Ollie. That's what it was. Uh, uh, and uh, it's uh, a it's a little thing that you can slide over it, and you can take microscopic, uh, you know, real right. close up pictures like this far away. Now the problem is that your your focal range it doesn't adjust focal range, so there is a spot where you can get the picture, but you can. Get Good pictures. So, where do you get little lenses like that? This, um, I buy them online. Oh. I mean, um, there's a there's a science store for kids in Cary on Kildare Farm Road, Science Safari. My guess is that they probably have them as well. And there are seen at the museum downtown. The museum. Oh, do yeah. oh, good. Big shop. Big good. shop. Yeah. 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 So there are there are. Cheap ones, I mean, you can get one for five bucks sometimes. Uh, there are more expensive ones. The more expensive one is the nicer one. This is my most expensive one. Um, but the problem with this is that it doesn't, so this lives on my desk, because it doesn't have a way to attach uh, a, a lanyard to it. I have one that lives in my backpack that has a lanyard, so I can you know, look like a real geek one walking around, and I don't lose it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, it's, it's certainly worth it, and uh, actually, if you become a master gardener, we give them to the trainees. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> but you can't do it this year, we've got our class full, <laughs> two more years. What about transfers? <laughs> <coughs> well, okay, well, when I order them, holding a lens. When I, and you're uh, holding a lens, okay. Oh, okay. yeah, and get an address sticker and put it on your hand lens because you will put it down and somebody will pick it up. And they'll say, oh, it's the least. <laughs> so, um, uh, but yeah, you, I'll, I'll order some extras. Yeah. Uh, so, you're right, I could do that for transfers, yeah. Well, with your background expertise academically, what's your perspective on this mosquito spray? stuff that's running rampant in the Oh, I know, I see all the signs. Well, you know, <clears throat> the way those sprays work is that in the heat of day, the mosquitoes hang out in shady places. So they're underneath the boughs of the trees <coughs> and up in there, and they're hanging out waiting for it to cool down, get shady, so then they can come out into your yard and nail you. <coughs> so, and oh, of course they're attracted to carbon dioxide, and uh, body odors and things like that. So they are really, you know, they've got, they know how to zone in on mammals. The problem with these sprays is that, A, it's a, it's a general 
pesticide. So it's killing everything when they're spraying up there. And B, more importantly, most mosquitoes only live a few days as adults. They're all developing in water and in warm weather, they can develop in less than a week. So what the, what the sprayers are doing is they're killing everything that's out there, but the insects that are emerging two days later are not going to be affected. So, I mean, if you were having a party and you really had a big insect problem and you're having it tomorrow, you might say it's worth it, but it is not. I mean, they have to keep reapplying that stuff in order to work. So you are reducing all of your insects. Uh, all around. Mosquitoes, what I would recommend is look for where they're breeding. Tiger mosquitoes <clears throat> lay there and you know they love the saucers that you put underneath your pots outside. You know, you've got this much water there and they lay their eggs just above the surface of the water and then they, the larvae develop in the water and then they fly away. And, we were visiting some friends and they had terrible problems and we emptied all the saucers on their patios. Two days later, we didn't have anybody. I mean, and, but now our other um, mosquitoes actually breed in deeper water. Uh, and all, also the tiger mosquitoes only travel a matter of a few meters from where they develop. So you have tiger mosquitoes, that means you have a source for the larvae to develop there. They're not coming from a mile away. Our, our native mosquitoes will come from a mile away. And, and they will breed in swampy areas. And so that's another problem. Now there is Dipel uh, for your rain barrels. There is, because there, uh, it does work on mosquito larvae. So that's another way to interrupt. You can use Dipel in a, in a pond. Of course, you know, if you have mosquito eaters, <laughs> for goldfish in your pond, that will also keep, keep, keep your mosquitoes under control. But, you know, it's important to sort of think about why are they there. Dragonflies. The Dragonflies are good guys too. The BT that specifically is mosquito dumps. Yeah. So it's a yeah. different one than that, yeah, that it I is. think. It's, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. it, the common label or the business label is mosquito dump. Okay. Yeah. But it's Israeli Enzus or something like that. So, yeah. So, yeah. Now, it, yeah. And that's another one of the. That's not the Egyptian. But I think it's another 80s. I've been quick. I'm like, um, bird bats are. Um, we have to leave a bowl of water out. Sorry. That's, that's fine. That's fine. But if you dump it. Or just swish it out. Mm -hmm. Just. Right. And, but that then. The, oh, yeah. Because they have to develop over days. Okay. It takes days. So if you're dumping your bird bath, or your bird bath has a constant drip and it's always overflowing, <coughs> uh, uh, you can do it, you know, a couple times a week, and you have interruptions that can't that can't be there. And you, if you just dump it or swoosh it out, they have to be floating. They can't take that abrasion. Okay, so they're not sinking to the bottom. Well, if you, they're really kind of neat to look at, actually. They, they breathe, they hang from the surface, and they breathe up at the surface, which is the reason why during the Second World War, when they were trying to control them, what they did was they put oil slicks out in um, uh, swampy areas. You know, pour a little kerosene out there, that'll do it. Well, it does, but it has um, collateral damage. Um, <laughs> but, um, but a little soap also, but you don't want to give soap to your birds, but uh, a little soap in say a, ro a rain barrel uh, can actually destroy the surface tension because mosquitoes require surface tension to be able to hang up there. But you're right, when you touch it, they will go to the bottom. <clears throat> so you really do have to empty. Okay. So yeah. back to the flea beetle. Ohio vegetable trials use barriers row cover to protect the plant until it was ready to bloom. Mm -hmm. And by that time, the, if there was any flea beetle damage, the plant was sufficiently large that uh, it might look terrible, but it's yeah. still going to produce. Well, and also, the, again, this is another one of these things of how many generations are you 
that it goes through. By the time you have a problem, you've gone through a number of generations. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you're right. Row covers were huge, huge row covers. Mm -hmm. Eggplant is a very warm weather plant, so you should not be setting them out until after Memorial Day. So you have a plant that already is about knee high mm -hmm. when you set it out, and then yeah. protect it with row cover and <coughs> it blooms. Do you have an extra time on your hand? Sure. I have all the time in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just leave my two acres of gardens alone and worry about that for you. This is well, why I stop and squash bores. Oh, well. Again, hide your squash. Yeah. I hide my squash in corn. And I well, and also people put foil around, around the base of the plant. You have to do it every player <coughs> where it touches. If I know. If it touches the ground, it yeah, needs I know. And people actually, it is one of the times that I would suggest one could use seven as a dust. Because you're not going to put it everywhere on the plant. You're not going to put it where the flowers are. But if you can sprinkle it around the base of the plant, you will actually um, And seven is, is, you know, I mean, that's like the safest one we have. That's for squash and zucchini? Yeah, for, okay. for uh, boars. Okay. So we use seven, but we could not use it until after seven o'clock in the evening because the bee lab is a quarter of a mile away. Mm. Well, if you're applying it on the ground, it doesn't matter because the bees aren't coming yeah, but I mean, that was the general rule. Yeah, yeah. But in fact, that was, that was extra cautious because uh, the bees are coming for the flowers. And is this a liquid seven or a dry seven? I would use powder if you were going to put it around. Would you agree? You don't do it. <laughs> no, but I get squash pores. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and you know, you nail a whole plant. One insect can totally destroy one plant. And you'll read, they'll say, go in with a pen and pop oh, yeah. the insect. But if you actually slice the stem, that insect is so far up there, you would never be hitting the right spot if you didn't know <coughs> because they move up in the stem. Yeah. I've had a friend do that, slice it open and get the larva out, only to have a week later another one go and finish it off. Well, and that's major damage. I mean, you're talking about, oh, yeah. you know, Fluid transport. <laughs> Other questions? Oh, this lady mentioned uh, row covers. Yes. I'm assuming this is a fabric or something. Yeah, do you, you want to talk to row covers? This is the light polyester. You can get them in different thicknesses. Agribon. A G R I B O N. Well, the reason I ask, I'm imagining bugs crawling under it and thinking, this is great. I can hide out here. Well, a lot of times it's flying bugs, so yeah. that you're trying yeah. to. So to slug, it won't, it won't necessarily get rid of your slugs because they're, of course, creeping on the ground. But most of your insects are coming in flying. Will, will mulch act in the same way if you really mulch around your plants? No, because, well. It's the flying insects. It's the flying are. insects that are your. They come in late. Come in. The row on. cover prevents the flying Oh, you're saying over the plant. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Over the yeah. Yeah. You right, so you're that. talking about Quonset yeah. Hut. It's easy enough. All you do is, is when I have my ends, all I do is I push the soil back a little bit, put the ends in, and then push the soil over the ends. It's a perfect barrier against virtually all insects, except the ones that are in the soil. And already. of course, and any there is this, there. There's this extra thing. You also can sell pollinators. Yeah. So if you need pollinators. If you need pollen. I usually use row covers for potatoes because of the Colorado yeah. potato beetle. Yeah. And but you have to make sure you don't have any in there in the first place. Yeah. Or else it's an exclusive environment. <laughs> yeah, right. No right. What you know, I had an experiment once with Colorado potato well, I was we were growing tomatoes, commercial tomatoes. And and I had all these different plots with all these different treatments. And one a couple of them were of course these wonderful systems. And um, I, and I had a plot that was infested with Colorado potato beetle, and I was so excited. Oh boy, I'm going to get to see oh, what it does to yield and da 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 da. The next time I showed up, there were hundred crows out there. That was the end of my Colorado potato beetle problem, and the, all my plants were covered. 
Yeah. And I thought, oh man, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the joys of experimental science, you know, you know, you don't control it. So it was interesting to see that, yes, I did get a problem. I was really hoping to see major a yield reduction, and the, and the crows came in and took care of it. <laughs> and then they all fell over dead, <clears throat> the crows. No, yeah, no, I had no pesticide. That was a non-pesticide plot. She always had that. The ones were pesticides that had no cholera on potato peels. <coughs> so. the, the insect pressure at the Ohio vegetable trials are very, very high. Yeah, it gets the, very warm in summer. Well, not only that, it's also the uh, experiment station for other crops. Um, Cornfields are nearby. You know, yeah. the, Crucifer people are there. Yeah, yeah. So we set in uh, this vegetable trial plot sits in the middle of everything. Yeah. And of course, tomato horn or tomato <coughs> fruit worms are also called corn ear worms for a reason. Yes. They're first on corn, and then they move over to your to your tomatoes. And they're one of those that goes through a good five generations a year here. Maybe even more the weather is but, but it's a good trial because anything that is experienced in the Ohio vegetable trial is greater than the general garden one ever. Yeah, that's kind of true. This is, this is the surround effect. This is why people can grow <coughs> organic corn with no pesticides in amongst, surrounded by fields that are all BT corn because there's no population to know about. Benefit of the pesticide, not pesticide. Any yeah. hints on white flies? Controlling up white flies? Well, they're, they're, they can be tricky because actually they have quite a good cuticle. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, <clears throat> and, and of course, they're very mobile. Uh, if you can hit them, uh, insecticidal soaps will work. but. Um, uh, again, um, exclusion may be your best. Do you have multi tomato? Everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> In your vegetable garden? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The vegetable gardening is much tougher because the pests that we have in vegetable gardening are really a different group than what we have in horticultural um, painting. The horticultural ones tend to be the ones with very few generations per year, and so you think, well, I can live with that. But in your garden, you've got stuff that's, you know, going to go crazy in your vegetable garden. So, <clears throat> not any easy solutions. Any more questions? Well, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.